Hi there, Mikey here with Burst TV. Last month, I started a discussion between practicing dental professionals on what they wish they would have known before entering the field of dentistry. Their responses were wonderful and super helpful to anyone who is considering going into the field of dentistry. If you haven't seen that video yet, you can find it here. And so it only seemed appropriate that I would follow up that segment with another question. Now that you're practicing, what do you wish your program would have taught that maybe wasn't covered? Or what are some tips and tricks that you've learned that have bettered you as a professional and a clinician along the way? And so this segment is going to answer that. And we have some amazing responses from newer clinicians like myself, and some of which who have been practicing for over 30 years. In response to my prompt, First Ambassador Terry Jackson wrote, I wish I knew how much actual diagnosing I would be expected to perform in private practice. From cracks in teeth to recurrent decay to occlusion and biting forces, besides periodontal issues. My schooling didn't focus much on these, but my doctors rely on me to diagnose everything I can before they come into the op every day with every patient. I agree. A lot of doctors do rely on hygienists to, you know, diagnose these things and give them a heads up before they come into the room and see a patient. However, I do think this brings up another good tip, which is when you're interviewing with an office, always ask, what do you expect to the doctor? You know, how do they like their appointments to run? Because like Terry, I've had dentists that I worked for that wanted me to diagnose these things and give them a heads up before they came into the room to do the exam. On the other hand, I've worked for dentists who didn't want me to give them a heads up before they stepped in to do their exam. That way, they saw the patient with a fresh set of eyes, and once they had completed their diagnosis, we could compare notes and come up with a treatment plan. My name is Whitney. I've been a dental hygienist for 12 years, and in the majority of that time, I've worked in pediatrics. So several times a day, I see patients with ortho. And I've kind of come to a sequence that works best for me, so I wanted to share those tips and tricks. The first thing I do is polish on the linguals, and then I like to take a traditional brush and paste and brush that tenacious plaque around the um, brackets. And at the same time, I have the patient hold a mirror, and I'm giving OHI to the patient and usually to the parent also. And then, thank goodness, we can use the Captron again. I, it's a must for me for ortho. Um, and then my favorite type of floss for ortho is this pick. I feel like it saves so much time as opposed to threading. And then this is the perfect opportunity to recommend the best brush we carry burst here in our office. And, um, of course the water flosser is also an asset to ortho patients. I agree, Whitney. Those flossers are really great. If you're a consumer watching this video, you can find flossers like this by Googling ortho flosser, and you'll see several results at major retailers online and in-store such as Walmart and Amazon. One of my favorite tips when I was working clinical is if you're placing sealants on a child that has a very small space to work in anyway, you know, you've got saliva all over the place. Instead of trying to use a bunch of cotton rolls and suction, and you know, you've only got two hands and they're tiny little mouths, you're fighting for space, I would actually take two of your saliva ejectors and stuff them into the high speed evacuation so that you'd have like a little a little fork basically. You could put one of the saliva ejectors in the cheek and one of the saliva ejectors next to the tongue. And if you angle them toward each other, you're actually isolating the tooth. It's grabbing all the extra spit. And you can use that with one hand and then use your other hand for the etch and the sealant and the light and it was it saved a lot of time and made it a lot more comfortable for the kids so that they didn't have cotton rolls and the little um isolators and a bunch of stuff in their mouth so it made it a a much more pleasant experience for both of us hi bursties my name is amanda um 
clinical dental hygienist for 10 years now and I really wanted to share this amazing tidbit that I learned from a um, hygienist that worked at a periodontal office. Um, so you know when you get that patient that has that lingual recession, they get tons of tartar there, tons of sensitivity. All you want to do is scale it off to help their health of their gums and all they do is flinch and go ooh and ah and it just makes your heart race because all you want to do is be able to do your job but you also want to keep your patient comfortable. So the best thing is to apply some fluoride varnish right on those root surfaces right when you start your appointment. Um, it, won't be too much of a challenge to get off. That way you can um, cavitron that right off and it's really gonna help with patients' um, compliance and returning. I know that this one patient I've been treating for eight years now, um, he was just, kept delaying his appointments just because they were so uncomfortable for him. Yeah. Now I have him coming every four months consistently and then his sensitivity has been way less too because after we're done with this cleaning, whatever varnish is left in that package, I reapply that to the surface and it has helped so incredibly much. So hopefully you guys find that tidbit helpful. I know it made a world of difference for me and for all of my other patients that have the same problem. Hey everyone, this is Sandy. I have been a clinical dental hygienist for 26 years. And one of the most important things that I have learned in my career is to always pitch in and help in sterilization. Makes your team so happy when everybody pulls their own weight, whether it's your instruments or the doctor's instruments, always help out because you never know if you're gonna be the one in need of help getting out the door at the end of the day or getting in a full lunch hour. So always help in the lab, that's my advice. Janet Tormey, practicing dental hygienist for over 30 years, had several suggestions for us. The first of which I wish I would have known when I was practicing clinical hygiene. For tight-lipped patients, place the plastic saliva ejector on number 18 and have the patient bite down tightly to keep it in place. Then scale the anteriors. Most people cannot activate the lower lip and the cheek muscles at the same time. Number two, use two tablespoons of hydrogen peroxide and a few granules of coarse pumice to remove any stain. Number three, do not talk about other coworkers. You never know who's related to who. Number four, know your worth and stand up for yourself. When you stand up for yourself, you stand up for all of your dental hygiene sisters. And number five, she wishes they would have taught us in school about insurance codes. And I agree, that is one thing I for sure did not know after graduation. And it plays a part into the everyday clinical job. As clinicians, all of our time is focused on our patients and caring for them. But I thought this suggestion from Eva Perry, a practicing clinician of 38 years, was very wise. She said, don't take responsibility for your patient's presence of disease or their lack of compliance. This is so true. If you think about it, if you're constantly taking care of other people and you're bringing their problems home with you, then you're going to be emotionally drained. And over time, you're not gonna be able to care for your patients with the same level of excellence as you once did. Hi, fellow Bursties. The one thing that I really wish uh, they would have covered more in school was figuring out how to patent good ideas for the dental profession. The one thing that I would always do 35 years ago was sharpen both sides of a Gracie because I got tired of having to flip it around and use different sides or the ends of the instrument. So what do they have now? They have a, instruments called a Langer. And if none of you have ever used them, they are absolutely fabulous. So for those of you who really don't like Gracie's, because uh, they're inconvenient and not universal, try the Langers, and I wish I would have invented them. Thank you. Bye. My personal tip is to 
polish before scaling. Now, I know this isn't what we were taught in school, but I started doing this when I was working in a primarily pediatric office and kids would come in with leftover lunch and cookies and things all caked on their teeth. Never mind the fact that they're not great brushers just yet. So I polished before scaling. And then I just started incorporating that into my adult patients too. And what I realized is that I was saving so much profi time. Think about it. When you're in dental hygiene school, you start out with two hour appointments and then they bump you down to an hour and a half. And maybe by the time you get to graduation, you're down to an hour appointment. But out in the real world, you'll have an hour at best, if not 50 minutes to 45 polish before scaling. It's comparable to sweeping your floors before you mop them. Get all the loose stuff and out of the way so that you can focus on the hard stuff. Two other suggestions we had submitted for time management purposes are a cordless keypad for perio charting and utilization of auto notes. If you are still in a dental professional program or a practicing clinician, I hope this video has been informational to you. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe to our channel and we'd love to hear your tips and tricks in the comments below. For tight-lipped patients, patients, patients.